Welcome to Entrepreneur Minds Speak. I'm Lauren with Creme de Mint, a branding and packaging design agency. And today I would like to welcome Zoe Gardner. Zoe Gardner is a self-proclaimed herb nerd with over 20 years of experience working with medicinal plants. Zoe went on to oversee product development and product safety at traditional medicinals, leading R&D and working closely with the marketing con quality control, sourcing, and legal departments. She now splits her time between working as a research consultant to herbal companies, teaching with and Blossom and creating botanical pottery. Zoe, thank you so much for being here today. We're super excited to hear uh, what you have to share with us. Lauren, it's a delight to be here with you. And um, I love working with packaging people. So it's exciting to have a conversation and, and dive into the regulatory pieces of things. So thanks for inviting me. Yes, absolutely. And so... Talk to me, talk to me a little bit about your background. Um, I know I shared a little intro, but um, yeah, share a little bit more about how you came to be the herb nerd you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, well, I've been a plant person my whole life. I grew up as a nature kid, kind of exploring the woods and getting to know the plants um, and just followed my interests from there. I remember my mind expanded so much when I learned that some wild plants were edible, which is something that some some people grow up with knowing, and, and that was brand new to me. So that was fascinating. And then I learned that some wild plants could be used as medicine, and that was totally mind-blowing and has um, you know, produced a big question at the time when I, I learned about it and um, has produced so many questions and curiosity over the past 20 years. And there's been so much to learn. So uh, the plants have always guided what I do. And um, so I've done herbal studies and really in the work with traditional medicinals, got into the regulatory side of things, got to learn regulations on the job, um, which was a great way because going in and, and looking at the regulations as they're written they're really not easy to figure out. So um, the on-the-job training was really wonderful to do that. Yeah, and talking about those regulations, it's super confusing when you're first starting out as an entrepreneur in that supplement space or, you know, even food and beverage or, you know, like it's it's hard to know exactly like what, you know, what do you need to pay attention to? What is truly important? Um, talk to me a little bit more about um, label regulations like who regulates them, how are, how are herbs and supplements regulated? Yeah, um, right. So herbs and supplements, yeah, most of the folks I work with are small herbal companies and everybody is in it for the passion of working with plants, right? Everybody loves the plants and um, positive health effects. I wanna say the medicine that can come with them, uh, but medicine is a word that we need to be careful about when we're talking about herbs and regulations. So it's always one that I stumble upon because herbs are medicinal and we need to be careful around that language. But um, herbal products fall into a bunch of different regulatory categories. So in the mind of an herbalist, um, medicinal preparations are, are just one whole category. Um, so, you know, we make topical products, we make products for internal use, we incorporate herbs into foods, and it's all herbal medicine together. Um, and then when we bring herbs into the regulatory sphere in the U.S., um, we have to put a regulatory lens on. And that regulatory lens from FDA in particular is that herbs fall squarely into several different categories. So they can be used in foods. Um, most often they fall into the category of dietary supplements, um, but herbal products that are used um, topically on the outside of the body, so salves and things like that, fall into the cosmetic category. And then some herbs are regulated as drugs, so whether that's uh, prescription drugs or over-the-counter drugs, and it's the intended use of the product that determines um, what category something is going to be in. That is what they're looking for. What is the intended use? Do you have any examples of something like that? Yeah. Um, oats are really my favorite thing as an example. So oats we have is oatmeal. So the it's the seed that gets rolled out, made into oatmeal. Oats that are harvested at the milky stage. So just before that, you know, the seed is becoming a true seed. Um, it's, it's seen as milky oats and herbalists use that to calm the nerves. It's a traditional nervine. And so... Uh, 
There's that oats, uh, colloidal oats, so the seeds that have been processed in a certain way are one of the ingredients that are allowed as an over-the-counter drug, um, so one of the active ingredients. And then cosmetic, you can incorporate oats into like a facial scrub or something like that. That would be a cosmetic. So it really depends mostly on how those oats are used and what you as a company are saying those oats should be used for. So what claim you're associating with those oats that determines the regulatory category. So just one other quick example would be um, peppermint. So you can sell peppermint as a tea and just like, here's a, a yeah, tasty beverage, um, or you can sell peppermint tea as an after dinner thing to help calm digestion, um, alleviate digestive discomfort. So here you're making more digestive claims. And because you're making health claims with that product, that's going to put you into the dietary supplement category. Now, are there ever any products that kind of cross over into two categories? Is that possible? Is possible. There's some cosmetics that are also regulated as drugs. Um, but for, for most of the companies that you and I work with, the small companies, then staying in one category and being clear on what that category is, is going to be the most helpful thing. So, so each, you know, if you're selling peppermint two different ways, you can sell it as a beverage tea. You could also sell it as um, a digestive tea. Then, you know, those could be two separate products, um, but you want to be clear and have those uh, labeled differently and, um, and sold separately. I've noticed that there's so many companies that seem to be non-compliant. And so that begs the question, like, does compliance with regulations really matter? Does compliance matter? Yeah, this is a head scratcher. So the answer is yes and no. And I'm going to say mostly yes, but there's also a little bit of no in there. So FDA has limited resources for enforcement of things. So they're the ones who really have enforcement authority and making sure that companies are um, making the right claims, um, not producing anything that might harm consumers. And because of their limited resources, they're going to focus on things that may be a risk to the consumer. So whether that's microbial contamination whether that's claims that are really outlandish, so supplements that are promising a cancer cure and maybe um, keeping somebody from getting what is considered definitive appropriate treatment for a disease based on their understanding of things. So um, anything that, that really addresses a heavy hitting health issue, um, that's going to draw their focus. So FDA doesn't have bandwidth to enforce everything. So that's why you see a, not, a lot of non-compliant claims. You know, one of the things that I see now is that it's not just FDA who is uh, monitoring things. Um, FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, also keeps an eye on claims and truthfulness and advertising. And then even more so, uh, what I see in terms of compliance, and this is where it really we fall heavily on the, the yes, it does matter, is that other organizations are enforcing what they interpret FDA's rules to be. So for folks who are selling on Etsy, Etsy has their own set of rules and expectations, uh, as does Shopify. I mean, we see that now with Amazon, Whole Foods has their own um, set of lists. Trade shows like Expo West and Expo East, the big natural products trade shows have their own list of compliance things. Um, and so if you are out of compliance with FDA, then you're gonna draw the attention of these other folks who are trying to mitigate risk for their businesses by, um, making sure that the products that are being sold through them are compliant. And how are they doing that? What's happening when company is um, not compliant and one of these other organizations sees it? Yeah. Um, what are they doing? I'm curious. Yeah. So um, Shopify, for example, um, I have a client who was uh, recently sent a letter that uh, Shopify thought that they were selling um, what they call it? Pseudo pharmaceuticals. So it's a dietary supplement you manufacture. Her compliance is pretty good, um, but there may have been a few words that triggered Shopify to um, be drawn to her site. And they said, you have 24 hours to find another payment processor because of your non-compliance. We're no longer going to accept your payments. And so um, with a business that was her size, that's quite a scary thing. And um, kind of redoing all the, the back end of Shopify. I've heard from folks on Etsy that um, Etsy will suddenly take products off and not allow them back on and not really provide any recourse. A lot of these service providers are big and a lot of the companies are small. There's not really a lot of recourse. 
Um, the other place I see it a lot is with folks doing ads on Meta, so whether that's Facebook or Instagram, if there's non-compliant language there, sometimes um, they get denied ads or, or various levels of denial and um, just great frustration in terms of um, working with these, at this point, essential tools, right? Um, and then the other thing is it's America, so um, lawyers are out there. And so what I hear from industry lawyers is that there are a bunch of lawyers who are stepping up and enforcing FDA um, requirements where FDA is not itself and bringing either class action lawsuits or private lawsuits. So there's also um, that piece of things. So uh, yes, there is a bunch of non-compliance out there. I think it's always a calculated risk, but I do advocate for compliance and it can lower, can lower anxiety quite a bit and keep companies um, just a lot safer and keep business more predictable. And we were talking about how it's very confusing on the FDA website to um, determine exactly what needs to be on their label, what can and can't be there um, as far as claims, as far as like all the things that we're talking about. What advice do you have for people who are who are in this situation? Like, where can they look? Are there resources? Are there places for them to look on how to decipher all of this and what should go on their label and what shouldn't and all of this? Right, <laughs> great question. Yeah, uh, I feel like a lot of people that I, when I talk to them the first time, they're like, is it just me or is this really hard to figure out? And it can be really hard to figure out. So um, I would say the label piece is more straightforward than other pieces. And you've got some great articles on your website about that. So those are like yeah. an initial great resource for people. And if they want to dive in deeper, like if it's tiny companies who can't yet afford a professional designer and they're doing their own labels or something like that, um, there are labeling guides for each category. So FDA has a food labeling guide, a dietary supplement labeling guide, and a cosmetic labeling guide. And so those outline all of the required material. Um, as you know, there's the epic detail on kind of like font size requirements for each different required element of the package. And it's simple stuff for those of us who have worked in that realm and for folks approaching for the first time who don't know to look for these things. There's, there are many details to look for and um, it is one of the great advantages of going with a package designer who's used to working in regulated industries and knows what needs to be there and how it needs to be displayed and all of that. So, um, so there's that piece. And then the second piece is claims. And so... Um, we talked about the different categories that herbal products can fall into. Um, so whether that is foods, dietary supplements, or cosmetics. And again, depending on which category things fall into, that's going to affect the different claims that you can make for the products. Foods, you can talk about uh, nutrient content. There's there's a few other there's a few other possibilities, but for the most part, you can talk about what nutrients are in there, and you're not supposed to make other claims beyond that. Or you can talk a little bit about you know, uh, let's say milk has a lot of calcium, and then there are some approved structure function claims like calcium supports strong bones, right? That's the one, the classic example that we've all heard. Um, for herbal products, there are more structure function claims that folks can talk about. So the way that the ways that different herbs affect the structure or function of the body. And the key here is how how the product keeps the body healthy um, as opposed to treating any kind of disease because that moves us into the category of drugs. So supplements keep the body healthy and drugs treat disease. So um, just as a quick example here, Hawthorne is an herb that really is useful for the heart. So um, if if I'm making a Hawthorne-based supplement, I can talk about how Hawthorne supports heart health. Um, the science behind Hawthorne also says that it's great for helping to treat early stages of heart failure, but that's disease treatment. And so even though it's truthful, um, that would move us out of the supplement category and into the drug category if we said Hawthorne helps treat um, or is good for uh, early stages of heart failure. And then for cosmetics as the, the other main category here, it's really claims related to beautification and moisturizing. So things that help keep us looking good, even if it is like a an all-purpose kind of first aid salve that we would make. So like a olive oil infused with healing herbs and then a little beeswax mixed in to make it convenient to put on the skin. Um, because that's used externally, that's going to fall into the cosmetic category. So while as herbalists, we would like to talk about how that sev is great for 
um, healing cuts and scrapes and has mild antibiotic activity. We really need to focus on moisturizing claims um, and, and then maybe setting the context for the rest of it. So, you know, keep it in your pocket if you've got kids and they have you know, bumps or scratches or, or whatnot. So uh, keeping that claim simple and, and setting the context for use rather than saying the thing that we want to say that's not compliant. And how are claims substantiated? So claim substantiation um, for foods that's going to be based on nutrient content. So that can either be lab testing for the content of different nutrients um, within the finished food product, or folks can do kind of the same thing they might do to calculate a nutrition facts panel where they uh, bring together nutritional data on the different ingredients and calculate um, you know, how much calcium or how much vitamin C is going to be in that finished product. So having that data on hand will be useful if you're making a nutrient content claim for a food. For supplements, it's a little bit more complicated because it's not always just testing one nutrient and then having a claim that comes directly from that. But um, I'm going to go back to that Hawthorne example for heart health. What companies ought to have if they're making claims and they will probably need if they're trying to get into larger chain stores like Whole Foods or other, other natural foods markets are substantiation files. So um, this is a document that each company puts together, one for each product that has one for each dietary supplement product that has a claim on it. And that substantiation file contains information on how we know that the claim is, the claim is truthful. So what evidence is there um, to support the fact that Hawthorne um, is useful for heart health? So that'll be scientific studies that I would reference in there. Um, Hawthorne has been used for uh, several hundred, if not a couple thousand years. So I would also put some traditional use information in there to go with the scientific scientific information. I would have information on the part used to make sure that, you know, if if traditionally the part was the root that, of Hawthorne that was getting used, but then I'm providing Hawthorne berries and flowers in a in a product, um, that's not gonna that's not gonna be useful. So making sure that the part used um, is what relates to the science and the traditional use. Um, and then the dose and then any safety information. So showing that the dose is not just like a little fairy dusting dose of, you know, here's a little Hawthorne, I'm sure it'll help, um, but really making sure that the amount in there is going to be meaningful to people who are taking that. Um, and then safety information on the product. So showing, demonstrating that that dietary supplement product is safe. So th those are the main elements of um, a substantiation file to support a dietary supplement claim. And then for, for cosmetics, I think it's not typical to have substantiation files, but you should just make sure that if questioned, you know, does jojoba oil really provide moisturizing capacity, then, you know, you could provide evidence to say, yes, indeed it does. So where do you search for this research? Like, where do you find it? How, yeah, do, you, great how do you know about that? Yeah. Um, so... FDA and FTC are leaning more and more towards science these days. So it used to be that some traditional information was okay. Um, and now science is really the thing. So there's a few different places that I go. Number one is PubMed. Um, so it's the it's a free database from the National Library of Medicine, and you can search all the science on anything health related. So herbs are in there. Um, and there is a little bit of wading through the science, but that is one great resource. Um, the American Botanical Council is another wonderful resource. So it's a nonprofit organization. They publish um, the magazine Herbalgram, um, and then they have a whole bunch of resources available on their website. Uh, so that's another great place to look. And then the one I should have said first off, uh, which is relevant, is uh, herbal information from other countries. So Health Canada up in Canada um, has a whole bunch of claims that are allowed for particular herbs. And so that's some good guidance. Um, it's got some expert review added into it, um, which is wonderful. And then the European Medicines Agency also has a bunch of information published on different herbs. So those all represent um herbs that have been reviewed by uh, a body of experts. They've gone through the science, they've gone through the tradition and said, based on all of that, these are the claims that we think are appropriate for um, these products. And so that's a great source of information also. 
And is this something that you help clients with? Like if they're trying to, if they're trying to say, they say, Hey, I have this product and I need some, um, sub substantiated files. Is that something that people come to you for and you help them with? Yeah, absolutely. What I'll do with clients is help make sure that the claims that they're making, number one, are compliant. So making sure because there's not amazing guidance from FDA on what claims are or are not compliant exactly. So helping to understand that. Um, and then going through and doing substantiation files, which to me is a delightful puzzle. It's like a great logic puzzle um, because it is putting together the evidence to make this product look really good. Um, I often, the, the advice I often give is like, think of the most skeptical person in your family. Like maybe it's the uncle who's like, ah, herbs don't work. And then it's bringing together information that you could show your uncle and you might get like a little nod of like, I'm not actually going to acknowledge that this is a useful thing, but all right, you've got some good information here. And, and I see that this might be true. So, um, so again, thinking of that most skeptical family member, but bringing together the science, bringing together information on dosage, and then information on safety, um, to really support a product. And I, you know, it's a document that's usually confidential and internal, but I, I like to think of it as something that really bolsters a product. I think it can give good confidence to the company, um, you know, whoever's in the company, whether that's a solopreneur or a larger team, but to really help that product shine and, and um, show that it does a good job and that there's a lot of backing for it. Right. And it probably gives uh, the people that are running the company more confidence um, in selling their products and feeling like, okay, like we know, we know this is a good product. Um, we know that we have these substantiated files that are backing that up. Yeah. And often those are key, because as I mentioned, to get into certain retailers, they're helpful for that. Um, and the thing that I find is because FDA doesn't provide very clear guidance on what claims are or are not acceptable, like there's not really a list that you can go to for that. Um, a lot of folks carry a lot of anxiety of like, we think these claims are okay. We've seen other companies making them, but then other companies also make non-compliant claims. So um, just having somebody who knows what they do vet the claims and give a thumbs up can can um can be a big boost and an anxiety reducer for um, for folks who are just starting out, especially. What caution statements do people need on their products? So caution statements, um, again, are determined by product category. So foods should be safe for general use, right? Hopefully you don't have any uh, caution statements on foods. Um, although there may be some like, I don't know, I think of that, you know, the, the famous McDonald's, um, this coffee is hot. Uh, right. <laughs> so, so it's America, we may need some statements like that. Um, <laughs> and then cosmetics um, generally don't have caution statements, but if there is anything that consumers need to be aware of, then uh, you should have a, a caution on there. So if there may be reactions in people, et cetera. Um, and then with dietary supplements, um, you want to make sure that people can use the products safely. And so if you have a botanical that is more likely to cause an allergy, although it's not one of the typical food allergens, but maybe it's something that people don't take super often, um, you want to list the allergies or any other thing, um, whether or not it's appropriate to take during pregnancy or breastfeeding, um, or if there's any medical conditions that folks may have, or if there are any um, interactions with drugs that may that folks may be taking. And so within that, the cautions can be super specific. So you can say, if you're taking any medications that interact with grapefruit juice, then don't use this St. John's wort product because that will also uh, cause some interactions with medications. So you can be real specific or you can be super general and just kind of mitigate your risk and say, don't use this if you're pregnant, breastfeeding, taking any medications or have a health condition, or if you do, you know, talk to your, to your doctor beforehand. So uh, that is a more generic warning that um, protects you as a company, which is more and more important these days, um, but uh, doesn't give your consumer a whole lot of information because that's kind of a standard um, on every package. So when I do cautions on packages uh, for supplements, I try and strike the balance of letting the consumer know truly where there may be a concern, and then also um, helping the company stay safe by providing some of the more generic talk to your doctor um, recommendations. How would a, a supplement manufacturer know if they need to have um, a caution statement? 
Great question. So there's a few different resources. The the health information for or the herbal information from Health Canada and the European Medicines Agency. So those documents I mentioned before, um, there are claims for each of the botanicals that they go over, and there's also caution statements for each one. So if there are known cautions for a particular botanical, then those will be listed there. Um, there's also a book written by the American Herbal Products Association. It's called the Botanical Safety Handbook, and that goes through 500 different botanicals and uh, talks about the safety information for each one. So you could list out any cautions or um, contraindications, which would be reasons for somebody not to use a product and include those on the label. So those are, are several different resources. And then if anything's come up in scientific studies, that could also be relevant to, to list. So. What if somebody comes and says like, hey, I have this like very rare ingredient that I want to use. Has that ever happened where there isn't any information in all these resources about it, but there's, you know, information traditionally, like maybe an Ayurvedic medicine or something yeah. like that. Have you come across anything like that? Yes, I would say you know, growing up in the States, you know, I, I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this that understanding that plants could be used as medicine was like, uh, blew my mind, right? And in other countries, it's all that folks have, you know, maybe there's access to a little bit of other medication, but plant-based medicine is, is the primary thing that people go to. And then other medications are hopefully available as needed. Um, so if it is something that come, you know, if there's a botanical from the Ayurvedic tradition in India, um, that system has been has existed for you know over two thousand years, and there's documentation that goes back at least a thousand years. So, um, so people have a strong understanding of that botanical, and um, any cautions that would need to be listed would be documented in the traditional literature. So I would go back to different books on Ayurvedic medicine that may not may or may not pull in the science, but do document the tradition, um, and that all has been really nicely worked out over many, many years. So uh, would they be able to use this for their substantiated files? Because it's, again, it's not science, it's right. more traditional medicine. Absolutely. And especially I would say for the caution aspect, I always like to include traditional information because I think if a botanical has been used for over a thousand years for something, then there's a lot to be said for that. It's not the same as science, but you know, so many of the drugs that get introduced to market um, we learn more about as they're used, right? So then sometimes things need to get taken off the market, et cetera. Um, and so science can tell us a lot, but it can't replace a thousand years of human experience with a certain thing. So, um, so I like both. I include science and I include tradition uh, as it relates to product cautions and keeping people safe, then if the traditional is information is all we have, then that's what we use. And if there's science that can uh, provide a little bit more understanding, uh, then that should be included as well. But if there are issues that are known uh, from traditional use, then we can report those on the package. So, you know, may cause a stomach discomfort or something like that. You know, that's something that we can let people know and set an appropriate expectation uh, on the product. So they're not call calling the company owner or writing in and saying, hey, they hurt after I used this, um, when really that's understood to be something that happens and and is a, a side effect, but uh, worth it for the overall effect of the botanical. Wow, yeah, that makes sense. In terms of claims, there are some ingredients that can that can be tricky for, and and I would say this is especially true for herbal traditions where the knowledge was kept and passed on orally rather than uh, cultures that have written documentation. So it's why using botanicals from India and China is much easier, right? Because they've they've done right. for a long time, whereas. Um, many herbs from the, the American West or from Latin America or um, many different parts of Africa, because the tradition there is more oral, um, it's hard to find information going back 500 years and say, hey, look, 500 years ago, they were also using it for this particular indication. Um, so, so there is 
geographical bias in the information. So yeah, there are, there's definitely some herbs, especially from the American West and Southwest that have strong history of use, but it's just insufficiently documented for what I need to see for, to be satisfied that I can substantiate a product and that it would stand up to FDA or it would stand up in court if a lawyer wanted to question the claim. They can't sell them or is there a way that they could create their own studies or I don't know. I'm curious if you've heard of anything yeah. of how, how to handle that. How could that be done? Um, let's see. I mean, there's a few different ways. So thinking as a formulator, if there are other herbs that have the same indication that would be appropriate to combine, then you could combine those two. Um, I'm going to go back to the heart health example. So maybe there's something, you know, a, an herb from the Southwest that's well recognized by the folks, you know, the indigenous populations who live there to support the heart, um, but there's not a lot of documentation on it, um, then maybe that gets combined with Hawthorne and that's a product with a couple of different active ingredients and the Hawthorne is really carrying the claim, but you're getting the benefit from the Hawthorne and that local herb. So that would be one way to do it. Um, I haven't heard a lot about folks using oral tradition and, and indigenous expert opinion, but I'm, I'm curious about that. I think mm -hmm. that's a, an area that we'll see more of in the future, um, how to document traditional knowledge and utilize that as part of substantiation. And then the other thing is just to have products that don't have a claim, so then it's hard to hard yeah. to sell. Um, but you can, you can give a little nod, you can make a very gentle claim, um, or start introducing a product to a market where people already know that herb and you don't need to tell them what this product would be used for. It would be sufficiently familiar. Maybe it's a, a traditional, traditionally used herb, but in a different, more convenient format. And then you're going to an audience who already knows what that botanical is. So is there anything that I haven't covered that um, you'd like to share with our audience? Yeah, I mean, just a few resources for folks who maybe want to learn a little bit more. One of the things I didn't talk about, but it's a great place to learn, is FDA warning letters. So FDA does warn companies from time to time about claims that are being made that can't be, that shouldn't be made, that are dangerous, and or if they've done a facility inspection and found non-compliances there, so they'll also send a letter for that. Often it's both together because companies that make non-compliant claims don't necessarily have their manufacturing operations compliant either, so it'll include both. Um, so you can go through FDA's warning letters. They are published. There's a general section. They also have a section just on cosmetics. So if you're a cosmetic company and you're curious as to what FDA has been caring about in terms of topical products lately, you can you can go in there. Uh, there's also a consultant, Asa Waldstein, and he puts together a um, a weekly newsletter. It is called Warning Letter Wednesdays. So that's a great resource. And then FDA also has labeling guides, as I mentioned, for each of the each of the different product categories. So those are a great place to start. And then I also annually co-host a conference called Emblossom. So for anybody who is in the um, herbal realm and would like to learn more, we really aim Emblossom at small companies who are trying to figure out compliance and kind of the many other aspects of running a small business. So that that's our that's our audience, and we love we love to bring herbalists together and build community and help provide um, tools for uh, small businesses to thrive. And that conference, I'm super curious about it. You and I talked about it briefly. Yeah. Um, when when is it? We've had three conferences so far. So we just did February as our last conference this year, and then for 2024, we are likely going to be in May. So not the traditional February, but move into spring a little bit further. Um, and we may have some offerings between now and then, some webinars and other resources for companies to uh, help figure out some of these regulations. And Blossom, is that uh, online or in person or hybrid? Yeah, right now it's online to, to provide the most accessibility for people. And we are looking to do some in-person events, but it's, a, it's just a different level of things. So, so online for now. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, I hope to attend next year or possibly speak there. That would be amazing. Absolutely. We'd love to have you. Well, thank you so much. I, You have been a wealth of information. And if people would like to contact you, what's the best way to reach out to you? Yeah, probably my website. So it's herbnerdresearch.com. So folks can find me there or through Emblossom as well. It can be, can be found.
And Lauren, thank you so much for having me today. I always yeah. love talking with folks who uh, are interested in nerdy things and are so good at helping companies navigate, um, you know, the things that they don't, don't love to do, but need to do in order to be compliant and to be successful in the marketplace. I'm happy that we connected and um, that we got to do this together today. Thanks everybody. This is another episode of Entrepreneur Minds Speak and we'll see you on our next episode. Thank you. Bye-bye.